during the last 20 years, there has been some reduction in the global suicide rate, but it is by no means enough in order to us, for us to meet the SDG goal to reduce by a third the global suicide rate by 2030. Today's launch of the new guidance that we're putting out today provides a clear path for, for people who want to get involved in suicide prevention efforts, particularly governments, um, but also other stakeholders, other uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations and individuals as well. During the course of, of today's webinar, uh, we have our, our Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who should be joining us uh, during the course of the, uh, of the hour. We also have a fantastic lineup of guests from across the world, from New Zealand, from the US and from the UK, who will tell us about how they're helping, to have, helping people to have conversations about suicide and about mental health. Before um, we get going, though, um, I did also want to say that at the end of the, the session, you will have a, a, an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists. There is a chat function on, on the webinar. So if you want to ask your questions, please post them in the webinar in the chat function and uh, we'll come to them, those that we can, at the end of the session. We will also be sharing uh, a recording of the session with everybody that's registered today and it's also being um, live streamed on WHO's YouTube channel. So before we meet our panelists, um, I'd like to first of all show a, a short video to introduce the topic of today's webinar. My sister was about 33 years old at the time. She was married and she had four children. My sister could not access uh, such a service that could have helped her at her time of distress. Had we had such a service as they do in other parts of the world, maybe, maybe my sister would not have taken her own life. Maybe she'd have found help. So when I was 20, I got my diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder and I gave up, gave up really quickly. So I was put into a hospital and I ended up running away from the hospital. I didn't want to live anymore. I, I just, I didn't see a future with this illness that I had. Um, I ended up on the edge of a bridge and I was talked off the edge by a stranger. He was walking past and he stopped to talk to me. And yeah, we had this, we had this, connection and I hadn't had that connection with anyone before um, and through his I guess through his his openness and his 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 kindness and his sort of patience with me I started to talk and open up and eventually he managed to talk me off the edge of that bridge and then six years later when I was in a much better place I decided to find him and, and thank him for what he did what he did that day it changed my life and so to be able to thank him meant so much I think whether you're the person that's um, experiencing suicidal thoughts and feelings or you're the person that's supporting them, the most important thing is to remember that those suicidal thoughts and feelings will pass. They do pass. It doesn't feel like they will when you're in that moment. When you're in that moment, it's so intense, but it does pass. And it passes through, you know, things like distraction or talking it through with someone. But that's the most important thing to remember, that it's just thoughts, it's just feelings. and. You don't have to act on them. It feels like you, you, you do need to act on them. It feels like that's the only way, but they pass. It's really, really, really key to remember that. My name is Talinda Bennington, and my late husband was Chester Bennington. He took his life on July 20th, um, 2017. Yeah, Chester, he was, my, he was my heart and soul. He was my best friend. He was uh, my other half, and it affects us um, pretty much in every aspect of life. His loss does affect us. I think there should be immediate support of local organizations that people can reach out to. I feel like there should be peer support. I think that's, that's really important. Um, I think when the trage tragedy first strikes, I found it quite hard to reach out. And so if you know of someone 
that is going through a loss like this, I would reach out, connect, offer help, um, offer support, offer a cup of coffee, just be there and, and be compassionate and non-judgmental. Well, thank you very much for, for playing that video, uh, rather a moving video. And I think the last uh, point that came up on, on the screen was a very important one. If you are struggling uh, or you know somebody that's struggling, then it's really important to reach out for help. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, both Johnny Benjamin, who you'll be hearing from shortly, and also to Linda Bennington for um, working with us uh, to produce that video and you know, share their stories. So before we go on to uh, our panelists, uh, we have now with us uh, our WHO's Director General, Dr. Ted Ross, who has on a number of occas occasions shown his commitment to suicide prevention and the commitment of WHO uh, to this important area of work. So I'd like to pass now to Dr. Ted Ross for a few opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Alison. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today for the launch of this very important tool. In 2019, one in every 100 deaths globally was due to suicide. Every one of those suicides is one too many. Suicide affects people of all ages, in all countries, from all walks of life. Every suicide is a tragedy that has a devastating impact on families, friends, and communities. That's why suicide prevention is core to WHO's mental health work. And that's why reducing the suicide mortality rate is a key target in the sustainable development goals and in WHO's comprehensive mental health action plan. But Although there has been a small reduction in the global rate of suicide in the last decade, we're not on track to reach this target. Some countries have seen suicide rates increase and many are not fully committed to suicide prevention. On top of that, many of the risk factors for suicide, job loss, financial stress, and social isolation have been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Unless we scale up and accelerate our suicide prevention efforts considerably, many more people will lose their lives. Fortunately, there is hope. Suicides can be prevented if we work together. That's why WHO has developed the Live Life Implementation Guide for Suicide Prevention. This new guide lays out a clear path to putting in place proven interventions to prevent suicide. We're very grateful to be joined today by a unique and inspiring panel of guests. DJ Nash, Jazz Torunten, Tor Tor and Johnny Benjamin. In the next hour, we will hear how each of them in different ways are helping people talk about suicide in doing and in doing so giving people support that can literally be the difference between life and death.
thank you to each of you for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing from you. My thanks also to everyone who worked on the Leave Life Implementation Guide. My hope is that all countries will use this guide to save lives and to improve the mental health of millions of people around the world. Because as I often say, there is no health without mental health. Thank you very much again, uh, Alison, and back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, uh, some important, uh, important words there. And uh, thank you again for your um, support to this very important area of work. So now I'd like to pass on to our panelists. And our first panelist is Jazz Thornton. So as well as being a, a mental health activist and co-founder of the NGO Voices of Hope, Jazz was also um, uh, received an award uh, just a month or two ago for the Young New Zealander of the Year. So congratulations, first of all, Jazz, and thank you very much for joining us today. So my first question to you, Jazz, is can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background for the benefit of our, our viewers and why suicide prevention is so important to you? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jazz Thornton. Um, and suicide prevention for me is, is an incredible, um, incredibly important part of uh, my life and my work and what I do now. And that's because it's something that I significantly struggled with for uh, all of my teenage years. I went through a lot kind of growing up when I was a child and the very first time I ever tried to take my own life, I was 12 years old. Uh, throughout the rest of my teenage years, I, I spent it in and out of psych wars and in and out of hospitals and wholeheartedly believed that uh, this was just the way that my life was going to be forever, wholeheartedly believed that the world was going to be better off without me in it. Uh, and I remember sitting in the intensive care unit of the psych ward and just trying to find stories of other people who had gone through this and had got through the other side. Um, and I remember struggling to find anything. I remember um, our systems being so broken. I remember struggling to access help um, because I didn't have a biological family with me. They wouldn't admit me into, into psych wards at times. And so I think spending so much of my life feeling so alone and battling this. When I finally came out the other side, I was like, if, if my story can help just one person feel like they're not alone and help just one person know that hope is real and change is possible, then it will be so worth it. Um, and so I chose to dedicate my life to, to mental health uh, advocacy, both here in New Zealand and, and around the world and, and do whatever I can to, to help people. Um, for me, that's been mainly through storytelling. I studied directing and, and have written books and kind of anything that I can possibly do to, to get that message out of hope is real and change is possible and encourage uh, governments to, to invest into the well-being of, of their people. So that's a little bit about me and, and why I do what I do. Well, thanks, thanks so much for that introduction, Jazz. And uh, you said if you can, if you can save one person's life, it will be worth uh, doing what you do. Well, I, I met you as we, we met for the first time about uh, eighteen months ago, and uh, from what I've seen of your work over the, that last eighteen months, I think I think you've saved many more people's lives than that um, from the work that you do. So, so thank you. Moving now to DJ Nash, uh, who's with us very early in the morning from the US. Uh, DJ is a creator and executive producer of the American, uh, the US TV series, A Million Little Things. So thanks uh, for getting up so early to join us, DJ. Um, and can you tell us also a little bit about the series uh, and how it came about? Just to un unmute yourself, please, DJ. I don't know how it even got muted. I apologize. Um, uh, thanks for having me too. Um, my roots are originally in comedy. Um, and uh, so uh, that's the writing I'd done in television for about the last 19 years. And then um, I had a friend who took his life and it just changed me forever. I used to, um, I was on this one show and it just i don't know if you ever had this type of job where you had to walk at lunch just to psych yourself up for the afternoon and i would walk every single day and i just was so aware of i'm not in a great place 
and I, I just need to walk to get through uh, the day. And um, one day I ran into a friend of mine and we both lit up and was like, hey, hey. And he said, we should have lunch, totally. And it was, you know, even though it's LA, we meant it. And um, he said, I'm really busy this week. How about next week? I said, absolutely. Um, and then he, he, he killed himself. And I don't think for a minute that uh, our lunch could have saved him, but I do think almost every minute I could have had one more lunch. And I think the effect that that loss had on me, it just made me, it was like a wake up call. And I think um, I wanted to do a show about a group of friends whose lives are forever changed when they lose the person in the friend group whose life was the most put together on paper. Um, you know, like me, he was a dad, he was a loving husband, and he just lost his way. Um, in the pilot, um, we make the comparison to um, John F. Kennedy Jr. when he was flying on that fateful flight. He, um, he lost sight of the horizon. You know, these instruments were telling him which way was up. The clouds came in, he wasn't uh, VFR trained. And, and so he just lost sight of the horizon and he didn't trust the instruments. And by the time he realized he was in a nosedive and couldn't pull up. And I think that's depression. Um, and so uh, it just, it's been an incredible three now going on four seasons of being able to tell these stories that are coming from such a personal place uh, for me and the other writers in the room. Oh, th okay, thanks a lot, uh, um, a DJ, for that. I'm sure a lot of people watching and uh, looking at the chat, I can see there are people from the US who are, who are watching this today are familiar with your series. Um, oh, that's good. But uh, <laughs> it's a... <laughs> so um, it's it's great to see that. You also made a point that I'd just like to pick up on very briefly, and that's that um, we can be speaking to even close friends uh, and not be aware that they're really struggling, that with, be it with depression, with suicidal thoughts, or or some other kind of mental health disorder. And and so sometimes it, it needs it takes a little bit of. Uh, thought and, and follow-up conversations to, in order to find out when somebody is really feeling uh, very low. Um, but the importance of those, those conversations and, uh, and, and just to emphasize that sometimes um, it, this, it, this, it is very difficult to have those kinds of conversations. Can I just say one thing, and, and I try to say this on every panel I'm on, and I almost, mm -hmm. and it's, which is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but every mental health specialist who I've spoken with has confirmed what I'm about to say, which is asking a friend or someone you know if they're thinking about hurting themselves does not make them more likely to hurt themselves. And yeah. I think we're sometimes afraid of having that conversation because what if they say yes? But um, as that incredible video demonstrates, and I'm sure as we're about to hear, like someone stopping and saying, what's going on? You okay? Sometimes feeling cared about and having someone uh, think about you enough to ask that question is enough to get you out of that nosedive. Yeah, you're absolutely right, um, uh, DJ. Uh, and indeed, that is one of the myths that uh, people think that uh, about speaking about that it, it's not okay to speak about suicide. It absolutely is and is important to have those conversations. So moving now to our third guest, Johnny. Um, so you will have seen Johnny in the video that we, we showed at the beginning of the, the session. So Johnny, um, he's an author and founder of a youth mental health charity Beyond, uh, based in the UK. Johnny, we heard a little bit about your story, but uh, can you tell us in a bit more detail what led you to get involved in, in mental health advocacy and more specifically the suicide prevention side of your work? Yeah, again, thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, very similar to, to Jazz, really, my own personal lived experience um, growing up. You know, I was, I was five when my parents first took me to a psychologist. And so we knew that there was something there from a young age. But, you know, when I was growing up, uh, mental health, it was not talked about at all. I didn't understand it. You know, I was struggling. But you know, at school, we didn't talk about it once. Um, I just wish that someone would have come into my school and, you know, just just talked about it, talked about, you know, say, just say it's okay not to be okay. Um, but, but no one did. And, you know, I then 
yeah, ended up very unwell with, with schizoaffective disorder. I was diagnosed with this kind of form of schizophrenia. Um, and I was, yeah, I was really unwell for quite a while. It, it took a long time to kind of get back on track. And um, I mean, ever since then, it's it's really been about managing my my mental health. You know, I have relapses and, um, you know, I had to go back into hospital and suicidal ideation is a, is a problem. Uh, it comes up. Yeah, it comes up. And uh, it's something that I, I have to deal with. I had a relapse last September last year. And that was, you know, that I had to go back into hospital. And that was hard with the COVID restrictions, especially. Um, and I was I was suicidal again. And it's, it's tough. It doesn't, unfortunately, for me, it doesn't. And I know other people might say, say it doesn't get any easier, you know. Um, although the difference is that I talk about it. Now, I think that's the big difference. And it's taken a while to get there with my family, with my friends. It's been a, such a journey for everyone around me, but I am in a place where we we, we can talk about it more. Um, and, you know, for me, I think why I'm so involved in this is I, I've met so many people that have been bereaved by, by suicides. Um, my charity that you mentioned, you know, we've got a youth board and a number of the young people on the board have lost particularly parents to suicide and you know I listen to them and I listen to I've met I've met so many people that have lost loved ones to suicide and that grief and that pain and it's it, it just it breaks my heart every time and I just know that there's so much more that, that we can do and you know I get so frustrated at, at the lack of um action that uh we so often see which is why i'm so happy that this is uh, happening today and I, I believe it will make a difference so thank you again for having me well thanks thanks a lot johnny and um johnny's uh testimony is also a reminder that uh, mental health issues can be with us for all are, are always with us we can have uh, times when we're in good mental health times when we're in bad mental health but it's something that we need to look after all the time um, so that's also an important reminder uh, to us all. I'd like to now pass to Dr. Alexandra Fleischmann. So Alexandra has been with uh, WHO's mental health uh, uh, department for a number of years, and she's led WHO's suicide prevention work um, quite some years now, beginning, um, and uh, she'll, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was 2014 of WHO's first global report on suicide. Um, but Alexandra, you, you've, we've heard now from, uh, from our panellists, can you tell us a bit about the Live Life Guidance that we're launching today and give us an overview of what this means, what this approach mm -hmm. is to suicide prevention? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Live Life is about implementation. There are effective evidence-based interventions. We know that they work to prevent suicide. So Live Life has four key interventions to start with, and these should be implemented in all countries. So there is the limitation of access to means of suicides, like pesticides, firearms, medications, and countries need to put into place the legal provisions uh, so that the means restrictions can be achieved. Uh, for example, there are pesticides and they account for one fifth of all the suicides in the world. So the ban of acutely toxic, highly hazardous pesticides is recommended. Then we have the interaction with the media for responsible reporting. And this is important because the way a suicide is reported can lead to more suicides, but also when there are stories of hope reported or when it's a story about how someone co was coping with their problems, how someone found help or how help was offered to someone, then these stories can actually help prevent suicide. And then there is the fostering of coping skills and problem solving skills in adolescents. When we know the fact that suicide is the third leading cause of death for young women and fourth for young men, then it is very clear 
that schools have to implement those school-based programs. And then we have, of course, the health sector response. So this is about early identification, assessment, management, and everyone who made a suicide attempt should be followed up. And those who are left behind, those bereaved by suicide, they need support. So through the universal health coverage, there's a strong boost to, to have uh, access to healthcare. But at the same time, there's still a lot of training needed so people get the help they need. And so these are the four key interventions of Live Life, and they're accompanied uh, by some foundational pillars that need to be in place, like a multi-sectoral collaboration, awareness raising, um, also the data and surveillance. And so in the Live Life Guide that is launched today, we try to, in a very practical way, to address each pillar and intervention and to explain the, the what, why, when, where, and how to implement it. And there are many tips for implementation. And there are 73 case examples from countries around the world to use as examples. So this is our guide, which is launched today. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Alexandra, for, for providing a little bit more information and detail on the different strategies of the live life approach. I think it's worth mentioning at this point, as Alexandra mentioned, uh, the important role of governments in implementing, establishing and then um, implementing uh, suicide prevention programs that currently uh, there are only 38 countries in the world which are known to have suicide prevention uh, prevention strategies. But of course, there's much more that can be done uh, aside from having a national strategy at a local level, at a regional level, with the group type of groups that um, Jazz and Johnny lead. And in fact, uh, I was just looking briefly through some of the comments in the chat, quite a few people who are joining us today uh, are actually involved in suicide prevention work themselves, either as in peer support groups or other um, uh, health groups. I, I just want to pick up on the last strategy that you mentioned, Alexandra, and go back to jazz now. Um, the last strategy, as a reminder, is basically early identification, um, assessment and follow up of people who are at high risk. Can you tell us from, from your own experience, Jazz, um, with many young people in, in New Zealand and beyond, um, why this is so important? Uh, it is so incredibly important. I know for a fact that if I had been offered proper help the very first time that I ever tried to take my life as a 12 year old, it probably could have prevented the many years that I struggled with it, um, or at least at least given me the, the tools to know how to handle it. Um, but instead, I was given a 15 minute appointment uh, and then a phone call afterwards, and that was it. Uh, and what I've seen consistently in my work, um, I have ended up uh, often at, at the hospital ED with young people who have tried to take their own lives. And we see time and time again, them waiting for hours and hours and hours, and then just being discharged with someone saying, oh, we'll call you. Um, and then about a month later, they're back in the emergency department again. And we are seeing this time and time again, not just here in New Zealand, but around the world. Um, people that are basically, I feel that our governments um, are saying that unless you are very rich or you are dying, you don't get help. Um, and that's what it feels like. You get told, oh, you have to come back when you're in crisis. Um, I've had a young person be told we can't do anything until you've tried to kill yourself. Um, and that's that's what ha is happening. And that's not OK. Early intervention is key. Early intervention will save lives. Um, but at the moment, we're not doing that well enough. And it is costing us, mm -hmm. our friends, our family, our loved ones, because people are not listening to the urgency of, of early intervention and actually wrapping around proper support. That's not just a phone call, because you wouldn't do that if someone was about to have a heart attack, say, oh, come back once you've had a heart attack um so why do we do that with mental health that it's got to change yeah thanks thanks a lot for those uh those really important points um 
uh, jazz. And it might be worth mentioning that um, it, uh, a month or two ago, uh, WHO released in, in collaboration with UNICEF, our Helping Adolescents Thrive guidance, again, which is, is really to help um, not only governments, but also organizations that work with adolescents and schools put in place a health, prom health promotion programs, and particularly on mental health, to help uh, young people build those uh, skills or life skills that help them to deal with adversity. Um, moving on, I'd like to come back to, to DJ. So I, I'm assuming DJ, when you started to um, have the idea of producing a, a television series about the theme of, of suicide, um, you, you talked to quite a few people about how to ensure that uh, uh, suicide was portrayed in a, in a sensitive way. Can you tell us a bit about that process, whether you, who you talked to uh, and how they supported that uh, creative process? It's so perfect that you're asking this question right now because I was just looking at the chat and I'm reading someone wrote here in the US, suicide is now the second leading cause of death for young people, which breaks my heart. And then I was looking at who may have written that and that is our consultant, uh, Dr. Barbara Van Dalen. <clears throat> so what are you doing up so early, Dr. B? Um, the other, um, you know, um, when I wanted to do the show, um, I uh, am friends with uh, Mike and Anna Shinoda um, uh, and they're just incredible people. And Mike had lost his bandmate Chester to suicide. And I was just hesitant to tell him what I was working on only because I know his life was um, obviously forever changed and turned upside down by the loss of Chester. They have been such incredible friends and so supportive of the show. They introduced me to Talinda who you know, seeing her in the video, she's just incredible. She's such a, um, you know, I, I, I'm so curious uh, to see what her life may have been like before this. It's a horrific thing that happened, but she is just um, just showing her true grit and I'm so inspired by her. The, the three of them introduced me to Dr. Barbara Van Dalen, who is our consultant and Dr. B has been <laughs> just incredible. You know, we go through every script together. We watch, I had made the pilot before she was our consultant. And so we watched it together and she gave me um, such important advice about how to responsibly tell a story. So we did an episode in our second season that featured a young man who was uh, on a roof contemplating jumping. And, um, you know, we didn't break for commercial in the middle of that, where you might be tempted to go, oh, that's, oh, stay tuned. Um, and we really just made sure that we were telling the story, you know, we're very aware that anyone watching our show may, may have lost someone to suicide. Anyone watching our show may be struggling with thoughts of depression or suicide. And it's so important that when you are telling a story that may trigger people to, um, to, to tell that story responsibly. So not breaking an act in the middle of, the event uh, was was key. I think also um, showing people reaching out and getting help. So even in our second episode, Rome, you know, in in the in the beginning of our show, one of our characters is about to take his life when he gets a call from a friend that their other friend has taken his life. So the show is just about um, it's not about one friend dying; it's about the saved life, and it's about seven friends finally living. So even things like that, where our approach to the topic is with optimism and with hope, uh, I think is really important. And, you know, I even have this serious tone in my voice this morning talking about this, and I know it's probably appropriate, but comedy is not, um, they're not mutually exclusive. I think probably uh, Jazz and Johnny, who have so uh, openly shared their own struggles, I think comedy is is a great distraction. I think it's also an important tool to know that, hey, I'm gonna laugh a little bit because those clouds are gonna part and the sun will shine again. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, DJ. Uh, it's uh, very helpful comments that I'm sure will be not only interesting, but uh, useful to a lot of the people that are 
that are listening to us today. And when we do, when the session is over and in, in the coming days, we will send a recording to everyone that's registered. Uh, I think we can add a link as well to a, a very short guide that was produced uh, a couple of years ago now, which was basically intended for filmmakers and others that are working in, in the entertainment in, in industry with some tips, uh, the types of tips that uh, uh, DJ's just shared with us about uh, ensuring that if you are going to cover suicide as an issue, in a, whether it be a TV series, a, a play or, or something else, uh, that you do it in a sensitive way that it isn't going to cause harm. Um, so, uh, moving on now to um, Johnny, and I wanted to come back to one of the other strategies that Alexandra mentioned uh, when she, she listed the four key strategies in Live Life, and that's um, promoting mental health uh, among young people and ensuring that they have the life skills to be able to, uh, to deal with difficult situations in life. So, Johnny, can you tell us a little bit about your, your uh, charity for or your organization that supports young people and what that work involves? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, Jazz mentioned the word um, early intervention and prevention before. That's the key with our charity. It's all about getting in there early. The one thing I will say, though, um, that I find um, in the UK, at least, is that there's just so much academic pressure on young people. And particularly, you know, with the pandemic uh, in the UK, young people are coming back to school. And young people are really, some young people are really struggling with their mental health, which is understandable. Uh, and teachers as well are really struggling. But what I'm seeing, and my charity is seeing, is that there's so much academic catch up pressure from the government. And I know the UK is not alone in this, other governments as well. They put so much pressure on these schools in terms of the academia. And so the mental health gets kind of left behind and it needs to stop. Um, and I think, um, what I find, and again, I, I get really frustrated, I'm sorry I'm going on a bit of a rant, but mental health is often a tick box thing, I find, in a lot of schools, workplaces. It's like, right, okay, we've done one session around mental health, right, we're done. And it really frustrates me, you know, with the charity, we get asked to come into schools and 30 minutes, we're given a 30 minute slot. And, you know, then the children, uh, the young people are just expected to go back to class and study and it's like, you know, we, we have to give time, we have to give proper time to this if we really want to make a difference. I want to see schools, if we really want to implement this, schools need to make time in their timetables and then not just be like once in six months, we, 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 we talk about this, we do this. And this needs to really come from, from the top, from the head teachers, from the senior leaders and fr from the government. The government needs to stop putting so much, yeah, academic pressure on them put real, real valuable time into our curriculums for this, because otherwise things won't change. It's all very well like saying, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. We're, we're gonna just add this in somewhere where we can slot it in. No, we need to make proper, we need to carve out proper time as we do for, you know, other subjects within school, whether it's maths or, you know, um, languages or, or history. When we learn about history, you know, we, we carve out time. It's really important. Well, our mental health, young people's mental health is as important, if not more important. So um, sorry, that's a bit of a rant, but I just think it's really important that we, you know, put a bit of pressure on the people at the top in these countries, the governments to change their way of thinking, because we know, we know that three quarters of all mental health issues begin in adolescence. So it doesn't make sense why that's not such a, mental health isn't such a, a big part of young people's kind of curriculum in education growing up. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, thanks, Johnny. I mean, the message is obviously there that it's not enough to pay lip service to mental health promotion. It's, it's a topic that needs to be taken seriously, not just uh, by the health sector, but by many other sectors of society, whether it's the care sector, uh, so, so social services, whether it's the education sector, whether it's the business sector, um, uh, because people are affected uh, in all walks of life and in, at all ages. I, I'd like to turn now to questions that have come in on the chat, because uh, we've got quite a few now, and uh, it, it's great to see that we've got people joining us from, from all over the world. Just to mention a few countries, uh, Nepal, Iraq, Cameroon, US, uh, Kenya, Pakistan, Trinidad, and Tobago. So thanks, all of you, for joining us today. Um, 
The first question I want to take is from um, Winter from Ireland, uh, and it's a question for Jazz. And she says, or, or he says, uh, how have you been able to get your government's attention on mental health? And do you have plans to spread this more worldwide to other governments around the world? I think a um, very, very good question and very important one. Um, for us, the kind of getting government's attention um, wasn't something that we were able to kind of do overnight. It was a lot of kind of working on the ground, um, getting into the local radio stations and getting the local newspaper on board and um, beginning to kind of start the conversation around mental health. And um, when we were first starting, uh, it had just been released that New Zealand had uh, the highest youth suicide statistics in the developed world. And so um, we were kind of able to start making some noise and and eventually when we stuck at it long enough um, and we, we kept going and we kept talking about it, um, more people started listening and more people started opening up about their own stories. And, and eventually it was uh, front page of, of our major newspapers about our, uh, this kind of epidemic that we're in of suicide and, and TV stations are talking about it and radio is talking about it and, and our country was talking about it so much to the point that when it came to our elections, um, everyone was kind of watching what our government was going to do on mental health and that's how a lot of people voted um, because of the fact that there was so much noise about it from the ground and I think that's that's really important is that you you can gather um, people that have the the same heart as you for it that can see the issue that um, refuse to take no for an answer and you just keep pushing and you just keep going and eventually um, and governments will have no choice but to listen um, and it was after all of this noise that our government released uh, the first, the world's first ever well-being budget and we saw 1.9 billion dollars invested into mental health um, and so yeah it was it was something that we started very much from the ground. Um, and manage to to get their attention but it's still a continuous thing um, of trying to to get them to listen and to listen to the lived experience voices um, and it's definitely something that we are we are looking at globally um, across you know how how we can be helping each other there's things that people are doing in, in Sierra Leone for example with um, lived experience advocacy panelists and um, and boards and governings that they've got together that we don't have here um, and so looking at it collectively I think there's answers out there we just have to work together to find them thanks jess and uh just just in in follow up to that question i would just like to give a shout out to our, our friends and partners in the uk uh, united for global mental health because it, it was thanks to them actually that uh, we got to know jazz and uh we'll put, got to, together with a number of other people who are, are doing similar work to, to jazz in other countries around the world uh, and are really creating a, a very powerful advocacy network uh, on mental health and, uh, and also suicide as well. So if you're watching United, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, another question. So Alexandra, this one's for you and, and maybe it's something we should have started with, although there's not a one uh, answer to it. And that's uh, a, a question of what are the causes of suicide uh -huh. or the factors influencing suicidal thoughts and behaviors? Uh -huh. Yeah, as much as there is not only one intervention, there are an, a number of different risk factors that need to be taken into consideration. So of course, there are mental health issues. Of course, we know about depression and alcohol use disorders and their association uh, with suicide, for instance. However, there are also other issues like um, experiences of, of loss in your life. Uh, it's you know, a breakup of a relationship, loss of a loved one. Um, so this, this can be a risk factor, um, but also experience of, of violence or trauma, interpartner violence, for instance. Um, and uh, so also loneliness, also loss of employment. Now with COVID-19, of course, there's a great concern about uh, economic downturn and this impact, which would then only play out later on. Um, and so uh, different risk factors need to be looked at and taken into consideration. And the important thing is that 
if there is one risk factor at play, one should already ask about uh, suicidal thoughts and, and then follow up with that. And if there are many or several risk factors uh, together, of course, then uh, the risk increases. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alexandra. It comes back to what was said earlier about uh, uh, the importance of having these conversations about, uh, about suicide and, and not being afraid to actually broach the topic. Uh, I have another question for Alexandra. So there have been quite a few um, comments and questions coming in about the difference in high income and low income countries. And this one is specific to live life and the guidance that's provided in the, in, in the document being released today. And that is, um, are there different approaches that are recommended for um, high income and low income countries? And how do countries that are, are, are have fewer resources, how are they able to implement some of the recommendations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is similar with risk factors. There are the same risk factors all, of the, all, all over the world. However, in, in different contexts or, or cultural backgrounds, the one or other may be more or less important. Um, and so with the interventions, the key, the four key interventions uh, in the live life guidance are really the ones to start with, the, the ones that apply to every country. However, there will be nuances necessary, for instance, with the access to means. So a country would need to know in, in their context what, what are the, 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 the main uh, means used um, and then intervene and restrict, if possible, access to that means with pesticides. These are found in, in low and middle income countries in agricultural areas where they're just in the household right there, readily, easily accessible. Um, but in, in other countries, it may be different means that are more important. Um, and um, yeah, so, so you really, you know, you have the, 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 the general message on how to get started, but then you have to, to look at your particular situation in, in your country and you have to look at the health service, what is already available. You may uh, involve non-specialized health workers. You may involve uh, people in the community to also early identify and, and follow up with, with people at risk. So there's some uh, context adaptation necessary. Okay, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit, but just uh, just scanning the questions that are coming in on the chat. Uh, and this is a question for you, DJ. Uh, and it comes from Kevin, who says, I'm currently developing a peer powered mental health resource that I've named our mental health club. Part of our mandate is to engage entertainment industry in how their stories and other media can best represent fair and accurate portrayals of mental illness. Do you have any advice for us? Wow, um, you know, I, uh, I came about this story in a really different way because I was just trying to tell a story of something that really happened to me. Um, and so um, it, 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 it's, it's a different approach. So I, love that the show has allowed people to have conversations that they weren't previously having or to continue conversations they're having and to feel seen. But my, my thing is just get up every morning and write what you know. So maybe that applies to what Kevin's doing where he can, uh, can continue to just tell his story and, and to trust that, that people will see it. I just know from my own experience, I didn't try to capture everyone's story. Mm. I really wanted to tell such a specific story. I grounded it in um, the people I knew and the experiences I had, and they just touched on universal themes. Mm. So I, I think my advice would just be, uh, it sounds like he's doing the right thing uh, and, and soon people will notice. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you mentioned the pandemic and the causes it has on all of these really difficult issues. In our show, we debated whether or not to include COVID in our storytelling. And for about 12 minutes, we considered not doing that. And then it was just so clear, how can you not when mental health is um, 
affected by feeling isolated, by financial troubles, by medical issues, by um, this, just basically all of the causes and uh, repercussions of COVID only increase it. On a positive note, as a writer, I'm always looking for that segue, the way to talk about something or to, to justify a character or giving a speech or saying something. Yes, okay, I know I wanted to say that, but how do you make that feel earned or feel organic? This pandemic has allowed us to call anyone and go, hey, how have these last 16 months been for you? How are you doing? I know I'm having a tough time. And so that the thing I said earlier about don't be afraid to have the conversation, now we have the way to get there. And you can go like, Whew, how about I haven't seen my family in over a year? I know how tough that is on me. How are you doing? And maybe someone will have an opportunity to talk about the pain they're feeling. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, TJ. Uh, and really, you know, this, this point about talking to people who have lived the experience and have gone through uh, this experience in one way or another, you talked earlier about um, um, talking to the band members of uh, Linkin Park and to Linda, uh, and the advice that you got from Dr. Barbara, I mean, these are all things that people who are thinking about embarking on this uh, topic in, in the entertainment industry in any way um, can do to, to ensure that, uh, that they, what they do is, is portrayed in a, a responsible way. So we're coming towards the end of the hour now. Um, time for one or two more questions. Um, first of all, one to... Um, jazz and this is about posting on social media and uh obviously this is, this is a tricky but very very per pertinent question and uh this is from Chantal and she says how can advocates post on social media without triggering somebody into attempting suicide so I, I, I would you like to take a step at answering that uh <laughs> yikes um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that I'm I'm always very, very careful about what I post. I'm very thankful that social media was not a massive thing when I was in the peak of my illness. Um, I think that social media can be super dangerous and you have to be so careful on the messaging. Um, I always try to ensure, especially if you're thinking about it on an advocacy point, um, that it, at, at all times, no matter what the story is that you're telling, you always have to add hope into it, that you can be raw, you can be real, um, but you also must be, you know, you, you must provide hope, you must um, be able to say that that change is possible, um, even if the thing that you're directly talking about is, is very, um, is very and really raw um it's you've you've got that you're always combating with hope and i i ensure that i do that in everything um that i post and i will often um, make sure that i'm not impulsively posting and i'm actually thinking things through before i put it out because as soon as it's out in the world people are seeing it and we're responsible for what we put online um so ensuring that we're we're taking time to can actually consider um what we're posting i don't ever put anything up um without Kind of checking over it and and making sure that I'm thinking of everyone who was was vulnerable and thinking would this have been something that would have caused more damage than good, and if the answer to that and you don't know the answer to that, don't post it. Um, is kind of my my thoughts on it. Thanks, Jess. That's that's good advice. Um, so the last question uh, before we wrap up uh, is is to Johnny, and uh, Johnny. So question here is what inspired you to start writing your first book? I mean, the question could be posed to both Johnny and Jazz, but I'm going to ask this one to Johnny. Yeah, thank you. Before I answer that, can I just say actually something I don't know, a word that I don't know if we've mentioned so far is, is listening. Mm -hmm. That's so key. It really is. I, I mean, you know, with my friends, um, particularly my male friends, a lot of them have really struggled during the, the pandemic. And, um, you know, I'm really trying to be there and to really, really, really listen. I mean, it takes, we, we don't learn to listen growing up, uh, do we? we? We learn to like, you know, quickly respond. And especially in this world that we live in, you know, uh, with the all meetings online, it's just, it's just so fast paced and we don't listen to each other and we don't take the time. And we don't give each other space. And I think that's so key. Um, I just, and I, I know, for example, some, some workplaces, what they're doing, is before they go right into their meeting, you know, they open Zoom, they go right in, they take a pause and they actually ask each other how they are or, they, or they'll start their meetings 
um, going for a walk with a colleague and just asking, because sometimes it's hard to look someone in the eyes and, and, you know, open up. So we need to be thinking more about, particularly again with the pandemic, like giving people space and time and listening, really listening. I just wanted to say that. But yeah, what it's, um, I think, you know, it, it's been therapeutic for me. It's been cathartic for me. I'm sure Jazz will say the same to when you, when you hide something for such a long time, when you suppress something for, for so long um and then you finally have the chance to you know open up it's just it's so liberating and so many and i've read been trying to read all the comments and so many people here are suicide survivors and they you know when you've been through something and come out the other side particularly mental health and you've had to deal with the stigma and the shame and the silence you just want to help people you just want you just don't want anyone else to go through what you went through and you know, there's some amazing people on this chat that I've been reading, setting up their own organizations, and it's incredible. And that's why I wrote my my, my books to try and just reach someone. And you know, as Chad said, if you just reach one person, I mean, it's worth it. But um, yeah, I, I really like the term um, um, wounded wounded healer when we talk about people that have uh, mental health issues, lived experience. You know, they. They have such wisdom and such insight if you've been through that. And I, I do believe that people that have been through it and come out the other side, they do have the power to heal other people. That's why things like peer support is just so valuable. So, um, yeah, again, sorry, that's a bit of a ramble, but uh, I think just want to reach as many people as, as, as possible, just, just to try and make a difference to, to someone. Well, thanks. Thanks, Johnny. Um, this, and listening, you know, you're right it's important to make that point before we close this uh because that's how it all starts of course to have conversations you need to listen to or actually uh, not just listen but watch and observe how people are are acting and uh body body language etc cetera, etc cetera. so coming towards the end now um to, to wrap up well as Johnny just mentioned, uh, for those of, those of you that have been scanning down the chat during the course of the hour, there are a lot of people joining us who are indeed suicide survivors. Um, so thank you uh, for being with us today. Uh, there are also a lot of people who are working in this field, uh, suicide prevention activi activities or mental health more broadly. So again, uh, we hope you found today useful. Um, you can find the new materials on the WHO website. We will put the links in uh, the message that goes out to everybody that's uh, joined us today um, in, in soon after uh, the close of the event. Um, but lastly, just to come back to a few words that we've heard um, throughout this last hour, and that's optimism, hope, and, and something Jazz said, change is possible. These are things that if we want to leave on some... Uh, key messages um, today, I think that's what they would probably be. There is hope. If you are really struggling, there is hope. Change is possible. And if you are struggling, then reach out for help. Um, that's so important. So thanks today. It's been great for those of you that we've known it already know. It's been great to see you again. Very nice to meet you, DJ. Uh, we really appreciate you not only making the time, but making the time at a really early hour in your day. <laughs> and, I just woke uh, up. Do we have any questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, and, and now we can see why uh, DJ started out in, in comedy. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, very much for joining us. We hope you found it useful. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.